the daily war against evil in our lives. A succession of emperors. And a global flood on Mars. All of this and more coming up next on the Quick Study television program. Stay there as we continue studying through the Bible. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Henry. I'm Corey. And I'm Ryan. And this is the Quick Study Television radio program. Great to have you with us today as we continue to go through the Bible in one year. Hello to everyone watching on the Cornerstone Television Network. We continue in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 through 13. Now today we're going to be focusing on this particular passage and we learn something which is very interesting. There is a daily war against evil. The question is, how can we possibly fight that war? And I think the answer to that question will surprise you. We'll talk about that coming up a little bit later. Corey, what's Bible archaeology today? Well, we've looked at a specific Roman emperors before, but we've never actually put them in order and studied them that way. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to put two in order and see what we can learn about the New Testament from their lives. And the complications of the Roman emperors yes. continue, ladies and gentlemen, here Flows on Quick over. Study. Also, Ryan is with us today. Janice has a few days off. Mm -hmm. Cosmic Mysteries, what's up? Yeah, well, we're looking at the possibility of a near global flood on Mars. On Mars? On Mars. But so many people say there was no global flood on Earth. Now they believe one on Mars? I know. We're going to take a look at it. All right, well, that and more coming up as we continue. Lots on today's program, so we encourage you to stay with us. Get out your Bibles. We are in the book of 2 Corinthians. This is the second letter to the church at ancient Corinth. Now, ancient Corinth was so, well, you might say decadent and well, unlawly that they called them when they wanted to insult somebody, don't be like a Corinthian. Let's study on. Join Janice, Corey, and Rod Hembry live every Sunday night at 8.30 p.m. for the Bible Investigators Program. We take your questions from Facebook, from Twitter, and also from the chat room about God, the Bible, and the church. Study for Truth with God's Word, Sunday nights live at Bible Investigators. That's BibleDiscoveryTV.com, 8.30 p.m. Eastern on Bible Investigators. Join us. study through the New Testament of the Bible, which really sets up for us the time period of the early church, it's important to know what is going on in their time period. So what we're going to do the next couple days is go through the emperors in succession. On the tales of the murder of Julius Caesar in March of 44 BC, his great nephew and adopted heir, the 18-year-old Octavian, began his journey to absolute power and a new name, Augustus. Augustus is a name that signifies something greater than human, and yet, for political safety in Rome, still slightly less than a god. Augustus would not promote himself as emperor, but something in a more democratic guise, the princep, the first citizen. As princep, Augustus would effectively gain control over the political sphere of Rome, the military, and Rome's deeply seated religious life. He would very carefully keep the appearance of the traditional republic, all the while wielding the complete power that has caused historians to label him as the first and possibly greatest emperor of Rome. After Caesar's assassination, Augustus' main task was to use and then defeat a major threat to power, Mark Antony and Cleopatra VII. Once they were dealt with, Augustus returned to Rome and, at least in show, respected the Republic. He relinquished his power back into the Senate's hand. But this, of course, only gave Augustus more power. 
He was to keep the yearly elected consulship and was given control over the provinces with the largest armies. He then ensured the loyalty of the army by creating colonies for them and a large retirement fund. But perhaps most provocatively, he created the Praetorian Guard, an elite personal army, bodyguards of the princep. When he could, Augustus also took the job of High Priest of Rome, protector of its religious traditions. His power was complete, and he spent it ushering in the time of Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome. However achieved, the time of Augustus became a time of stability, trade, travel, and prosperity. It is one thing to defend ourselves for the sake of ego. It is another to defend the truth for the sake of others. In 2 Corinthians, Paul's interest is not to preserve his reputation, but to show the Corinthians how to detect the truth from lies. Chapter 10 brings this personal appeal from the former Pharisee. Chapter 11 shows the desperation of the apostle to show the church the difference between manly performance and godly conduct. Chapter 12 reveals a personal example of how and why God doesn't answer prayer sometimes, while chapter 13 concludes 2 Corinthians with a final warning against false teachers and prophets. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 11. Now I, Paul, myself am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am lowly among you, but being absent am bold toward you. But I beg you that when I am present, I may not be bold with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Do you look at things according to the outward appearance? If anyone is convinced in himself that he is Christ's, let him again consider this in himself, that just as he is Christ's, even so we are Christ's. For even if I should boast somewhat more about our authority, which the Lord gave us for edification and not for your destruction, I shall not be ashamed lest I seem to terrify you by letters. For his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Let such a person consider this, that what we are in word by letters when we are absent, such we will also be indeed when we are present. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 11. Boy, what a, what a troubled church, the church at Corinth. Uh, Paul, in his dissertation of trying to explain the truth, not for his own ego, but for their sake, is an interesting commentary. You know, too many scriptures are often quoted like cliches or slogans. Uh, the scriptures must never be confined to simple sound bites used to make our personal points. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul speaks to the church at Corinth saying, the weapons of our warfare are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Now he's not simply speaking about deep and devoted prayer. Actually, that's not the context here. The truth is there can be no deep devoted prayer without a heart and a mind profoundly dedicated to the ways and the wisdom of Christ. So when our lifestyles are in harmony with God's word, we have an effective, powerful weapon against the ways of Satan. And that's really what I want to talk about because there are so many people today who are bound up with the idea of spiritual giftings as their source of power. 
But what I hear and what I see in reading 2 Corinthians chapter 10 is something very different. As we look at this particular passage in context, we learn three truths to live by that help us understand our power in obeying and being in obedience to the laws of Christ. Here is 2 Corinthians 10, 1 to 4. Paul says, Now I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you by the meekness and the gentleness of Christ, note that, who in presence am lowly among you, but being absent, am bold toward you. But I beg you that when I am present, I may not be bold with, my com- with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some who think of us as we walked according to the flesh. Verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not walk or war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. Now, what does this mean? Well, here is truth to live by, number one. Beloved, the war against evil is waged in our daily examples of devotion to God and faithfulness to His Word. I want to tell you there is nothing quite so powerful as a life that has been lived in faithfulness. How do you argue with that? You can have the greatest arguments against God. You can have the greatest ideas against Christianity. But when you see someone whose life has sustained faithfulness throughout their whole lifetime and they finish well, you can't argue with that. It is a life fruitful and well worth living. So the weapons of our warfare are faithfulness. Now we go to chapter 10, verse 4 to 6. Paul says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. Verse 5. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing, watch this now, every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Again, I want to say this in Truth to Live By number two. The greatest weapon of war against Satan's kingdom, beloved, is our faithfulness to God's Word. You and me, no matter how hard it is to keep the battle up, and, and if you're like Paul and like me, uh, I, Paul the Apostle says, you know, I don't do what I want to do, and I do what I don't want to do. Who will save me from this wretched man that I am? Now, Paul, he's an apostle. But I, I recognize as someone who's just a servant how difficult it is to live this life in Jesus Christ, to war with the flesh, But when we begin to win through the power of the Holy Spirit, it is a defeat to Satan. Now we conclude with 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 7 to 11. He says, Do you look at things according to the outward appearance? If anyone is convinced in himself that he is Christ, let him again consider this in himself, that just as he is Christ, even so we are Christ. Verse 8, for, uh, for even if I should boast somewhat more about our authority which the Lord gave us for the edification and not uh, for your destruction, I shall not be ashamed. Verse 9, lest I seem to terrify you by letters. For his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech is contemptible. Verse 11, let such a person consider this, that what we are in word by letters when we are absent, such we will also be indeed when we are present. Now here is what Paul is saying. So important today, beloved, the Spirit of God's Word organizes and orders the management of the church, not the leadership giftings of men or women. So many times today, we believe that it's somebody's leadership gifting or their charisma or their ability to uh, persuade people or sell the masses that makes a great church. And Paul says that is not the case. See, the truth is that Jesus Christ is the head of the church, and the order of the Holy Spirit comes on the church. And so Paul, when he is present with them, appears somewhat timid when absent through the power of the Holy Spirit. He has the Word of God. But Paul does not want to express his powerful giftings when present with them. He wants them to look to Jesus Christ as the author and the finisher of their faith. And that is true and absolute humility.
earlier in the program today, we talked about Augustus, the leader of the Roman people, who historians have labeled the first emperor of Rome. Well, now we're going to look at his successor. Take a look. As princep, chief citizen of the Empire of Rome, Caesar Augustus had manipulated the lives of those close to him. Unfortunately for Rome, people change more than laws when they are moved or bent. Augustus needed an heir. He married his young daughter Julia first to his nephew, who died shortly after, and then to one of his army commanders, whom Julia had two sons with. But this second husband died also. So Augustus turned to his stepson Tiberius and required him to divorce his current wife to marry Julia. This did not work. Julia's two sons died, and Julia herself became so promiscuous that Augustus banished her to a penile colony. Tiberius had become the default heir. Tiberius took full control when he was 55 years old, and he took a different approach to governing Rome. He retreated away from the city and endowed more power to the commander of the Praetorian Guard, personal army of the princep. Sejanus. Reports of Tiberius's time away from Rome are disturbing. It seems he denied himself nothing that he wanted, setting up for himself debased fantasies on his own private island. His peace was soon threatened by the very man he had entrusted with power, Sejanus. Sejanus had positioned himself to take over after Tiberius, and there was a nasty rumor that he was responsible for the death of Tiberius's own son. Tiberius came back to Rome. He began a reign of terror, a great purge of anyone even distantly connected to Sejanus. Torture and execution became the new law. The empire was walking on eggshells, trying to stay off of Tiberius's bloody radar. This included the governor of Judea that Judanus had appointed. His name was Pontius Pilate. In the dictionary, the word faith is defined as confidence or trust in a person or thing. A belief that is not based on proof, yet will be substantiated by fact. But is this faith? Is faith just a spiritual word for luck? Or is faith nothing more than a New Age term, destiny? The Bible calls faith substance and a real thing, not a mystical belief. Faith in God's ability to act and react in your life has been deeply abused by non-biblical teaching and the ideas of man in our present culture. But now we invite you to join Rod Hembry as he explores and searches out the real power and meaning of real faith in God's power and authority. This is a special audio CD and a DVD Bible study on The Essence of Faith with Rod Hembry. These two discs, one for audio listening in the car and the other is a DVD for watching interactive Bible studies, are available to you for a gift of $20 or more. To reserve your copy of The Essence of Faith, a Bible study on the faith in God's power, write or call today. Write to P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2, or P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 156680150. Immediate downloads are available for giving on the Internet at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. In ancient Corinth, the spirit of enterprising was bound to the social atmosphere, along with the pimping of temple prostitutes and the carving and forging of idols. Many in the Corinthian church were trying to acquire power and wealth by managing the church man's way. So Paul confronts this. The church has a leak. The world was getting into its soul. It was expressed and pronounced in the bickering and the posturing for power by the leadership. The amazing truth of 2 Corinthians chapters 10 through 13 is this. The sobering confrontations of Paul in ancient Corinth are still relevant and needed in today's modern enterprising church. That's not necessarily a good thing, Corey. No, no, it is not. And so this 
this particular First and Second Corinthians relates even today, I think, it in sure a very does. scary May we not let the world get in our soul. Cosmic Mysteries, Ryan, what are we talking yeah. about? Well, in this edition of Cosmic Mysteries, we're looking at the possibility of a past flood on Mars. Check mm -hmm. it out. The global flood of the Earth, mentioned in the Bible, is a commonly rejected idea. The most common man-made idea is that some other catastrophe happened to cause the extinction of the dinosaurs and other life, mainly an asteroid or meteor that struck the Earth. This idea does not suggest a fast extinction. According to this idea, the asteroid's impact sent dust and debris into the atmosphere, blocking the sunlight, which cut off the needed sunlight for the plants. With no plants for food, the dinosaurs and other life would die. But what does the evidence we are finding show? Asteroid impacts massive enough to destroy the dinosaurs and other life would have left at least some traces of meteors in the fossil-bearing rocks. However, the rocks in which fossils are found contain no certain fragments of meteors. Beyond that, there is no crater large enough on the Earth to match an impact of that size. Some scientists have claimed that they have found extremely large impact craters. For example, the Chicxulub crater in Mexico. This crater is not a new discovery, though. It has been known for decades and was said to be the result of a volcano before it was popular to account for extinction by meteors. The evidence found fits nicely with the global flood. From the observation of the Grand Canyon, to the dead fish and sea life found on high mountains, to the fossils found in mid-birth, all of these things point to a global flood. Further extinction can be explained from the climate change after the flood. Interestingly enough, Mars also shows evidence of a near-global flood in the past. Although there is no water on Mars anymore, on Mars' surface are river canyons. These canyons are similar to, but much bigger than the Grand Canyon on the Earth. It is believed that the water came from below the planet's surface. The same astronomers who reject the global flood on Earth believe that Mars once had a near-global flood. This is very interesting and ironic because they can accept a global flood on Mars, but not on the Earth. The same evidence rejected on one planet, but accepted on another. It is clear that the reason Noah's flood is commonly rejected is not due to lack of evidence, but because mankind is unwilling to accept the fact that we are responsible for our actions and will eventually have to answer to an almighty creator. Do you see the bias here? There's more evidence for a global flood on Earth, yet most will deny the flood of the Earth, while at the same time believing that Mars had a near-global flood. Yeah, it is really interesting. And, and, and what's, what's striking to me, Ryan, is that how many in the church feel like they have to harmonize themselves with mm -hmm. what people who don't believe in the Bible are saying to somehow validate themselves or make themselves look smart. Yeah. But that's very troubling when we have to validate ourselves by uh, secular ideas, ideas without God, and then try to make ourselves important with God. Paul mm -hmm. said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel says that the world is not this way because it's been this way for billions of years. It's this way because of sin mm -hmm. over That's thousands right. of worlds. Yeah. Very interesting. Corey, we have a did you know moment. Ryan has brought to us founding fathers. This ought to be interesting. Yeah. Well, all right, Ryan. So let's take a look at our first one here. This is founding fathers. Corey, yeah, well, did you know? Yeah, I want to look at Leonardo da Vinci here. His fields were dynamics, anatomy, physics, optics, biology, hydraulics, and aeronautics. He was considered the real founder of modern science. Leonardo da Vinci was far ahead of his time. He was a brilliant engineer, architect, and painter. He practiced scientific experimentation long before the scientific method was even thought of. His science journals are filled with studies in physics, hydraulics, dynamics, optics, aeronautics, biology, and anatomy. Leonardo was also a sincere believer in Jesus Christ. Even if no other evidence for his faith was available, his famous painting entitled The Last Supper bears witness to this. All accounts of da Vinci claim he was gra a gracious and kind man and a man of high moral character. Very interesting. And ladies and gentlemen, 
Uh, beginning next year in 2012, Ryan will be with us every Friday for Space Friday. I'm excited. I'm looking <laughs> forward to it. That sounds very cool. We should, there should be an opener for that. Space <laughs> yeah. Friday. With an echo. Yeah, Friday. Yeah, Friday. Yeah. Friday. Yeah, very good. And so we're looking forward to 2000. Thank you, Ryan. We're looking mm -hmm. forward to 2012. We want to encourage you to become a part of that. Now, we send the Quick Study Pocket Guide to people who support this ministry in any amount. That's where our resources come from. That's how we can continue here each and every day. We are going to automatically send the, the 2012 Quick Study Pocket Guide in December for January to those who are on the mailing list. If you are not on the mailing list, you will not receive it. So when you do give an offering in any amount, make sure you ask for the 2012 Quick Study Pocket Guide. We are going through the Bible again next year in 2012. We are exploring the energy of God's Word in our lives. And also, we'll be praying. Here's Watch and Pray. Every man, every woman has a place in their heart that desires supernatural contact. We are creatures as human beings, not created for this world only. Many try to fill that with different kinds of things, but the truth is only Jesus Christ will fill that need. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 in the Bible says, God has put eternity in the heart of every person. So I want to invite you to ask Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior to come into your life. This world, if you're like me, doesn't have enough for you. You need a connection, and that connection is through Jesus Christ. He has promised to take care of you, and he's promised to protect you from the evil. And so, may I encourage you today to ask him to come into your life and know God. You say, Rod, what do I do? How do I do that? Very simple. He made it simple so that we could all do it. Pray and say, Lord, I believe you died on the cross and rose again. And today I take you as Lord and Savior of my life. If you pray sincerely, he will respond. It's an all-new pocket guide taking you through the Bible in 2012. Make sure you're on the mailing list. For all of those who give regularly, we put you on the mailing list and automatically send you the 2012 January pocket guide. We're doing it all again. You can find out more at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Thank you.